I need some traction. You need some traction. This is Lloyd Lobo, co-founder at Boast AI. Uh, today's webinar, Traction Webinar, is brought to you by Boast AI Launch Academy in partnership with Founder Institute, Lazaridis Institute, Glo Growth Blazers, and BCF Ventures. I'm super excited because today's topic is one that's dear to my heart. I feel like your, your product or your service will never become a commodity if you build a community. Stack Overflow, they've built a community of 120 million software developers. Welcome to Traction. How are you doing? Very good. Thanks, uh, Lloyd, for having me and for, for us to get an opportunity to chat about communities and Stack Overflow. Prashant, before we dive into today's topic and go into this community and product-led and all of that stuff, would love to get a, your story. Like you came to the U.S. when you were 17 and today you're running one of the largest uh, communities. Give us your backstory. How did you get into all of this? Yeah, no, thanks, uh, Lloyd. And so we have some commonalities on this one. Uh, uh, I grew up in India until I was about 17 in, uh, in a city called Bangalore, India, which is sort of known as the Silicon City of India. Um, and, you know, I just uh, was very fortunate to have uh, parents who were, you know, very um, open to, you know, growth and, you know, sending their kids to, to study abroad and so on. So I uh, luckily got a scholarship when I was uh, in high school to come to the U.S. to go to university uh, to study computer engineering. And I, uh, I showed up on the East Coast in Maine uh, and it was just an amazing four years of, uh, of engineering education. Uh, and that was sort of, you know, so I'm an immigrant to the country uh, and you know, it's just been a phenomenal journey since I've joined, uh, you know, uh, effectively started uh, as an engineer, worked in a couple of different companies, then decided that, you know, my uh, true passion was helping sort of understand sort of the bigger picture of tech companies and really helping them scale. And so I sort of moved various functions, always in technology, one way or the other, whether it was consulting or, or even finance, and then ultimately uh, took on an operating uh, role at Rackspace, uh, which is where I, was, where I was for about seven years, right before I joined Stack Wolf. And at Rackspace, a lot of my work was focused on cloud services, on AWS and uh, Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud, and that's the business I helped uh, lead and grow. Uh, and, you know, Stack Overflow, uh, it just sort of uh, serendipitously, they were looking for a CEO and, uh, you know, this, this company, I couldn't, obviously, uh, I was so thrilled uh, about the opportunity because it creates such a large impact to your point around 100 million people. And uh, that's when I joined in October of 2019. And it's been a great, uh, great journey since. What, what was the driving factor besides like a CEO title, big community that, that made you take the Stack Overflow job because it's a lot of responsibility too and you're alone at the top, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, less the title, more I think, you know, for me, there were two primary reasons. So the first one is just, you know, you don't get a, 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 you know, a lot of opportunities in life to positively impact 100 million monthly visitors. That's a lot of people, right? So that, that comes with this sort of sense of fulfillment about working towards a goal that's like much bigger than anybody uh, in one lifetime, even like, you know, we, we really believe this is an institution that will stay for, for many, many decades uh, and years. So I think that that was the biggest draw was just the impact that it drives globally. Uh, and it's so, so vast and it helps so many people. The second reason was a lot of the work that I'd done at Rackspace around helping scale the cloud services business, uh, you know, just a very traditional, almost like, you know, it's effectively sort of a SaaS model scaling with, you know, everything from, uh, you know, specialized sales to customer success to product engineering, all of that, uh, you know, really bringing that expertise to help uh, with the product led transformation at Stack Overflow, uh, which is really what we're now undergoing as we build on that foundation, the community with our SaaS business. So, so that's really what, uh, you know, attract the second reason why I came on board, because I thought I could contribute to that. Definitely. I mean, it's, it's a phenomenal community. You guys are creating a massive impact. How many uh, employees does uh, Stack Overflow have? And I'm assuming you guys are fairly distributed, right? Or yeah, so we, you know, we're approximately we are hiring quite a bit, by the way. So if anybody, if you, anybody that's listening uh, who's interested in uh, in great roles and working for our mission, uh, please apply for our open jobs. We've got just a ton of ton of roles we're trying to fill. Uh, we are about uh, 300 people or so, um, and. Uh, if you think about, you said this and you're growing, so we will very easily, you know, grow by 30%, uh, you know, this year uh, in terms of headcount. Um, the distribution, yeah, pre-COVID, 
Uh, we were about 40% of our company was remote. 80% of product engineering was remote, 60% of marketing was remote. So we were a very heavy remote distributed team to begin with. We have people all around the world, uh, you know, places like Russia and Brazil and, uh, and, uh, and of course in the US and the UK where our primary offices are. Um, and now of course everybody's 100% remote, but as part of a result of COVID and the pandemic, our recruiting drive has been completely distributed. So glad to have you here. So Prashant, without further ado, please take it away. Okay, so uh, so I'm Prashant, um, and you you know you can reach me on uh, on on Twitter or LinkedIn anytime you'd like. And you know we're fairly sort of active on LinkedIn primarily, uh, but look forward to sort of engaging with this community, which is a great community. And also thanks again, Lloyd, for the opportunity to share our story. So today's topic, um, you know, we I thought we would talk about you know, really are thinking around how to scale B2B SaaS companies and with a special focus on community building, uh, which is obviously our specialty and what we're known for. Uh, and as you know, you know, Stack Overflow, it's all about communities. We have a core focus on developers and technologists, and we're in the midst of transforming and scaling into a product-led SaaS company. And I'll explain what that is here in a second. Uh, I joined, as Lloyd mentioned, uh, as CEO of Stack after about a seven-year stint uh, as a senior leader at Rackspace, uh, where I led their cloud services business. And the company obviously also, if, you've, uh, if you paid attention to it, it went public uh, after about four years under private equity ownership. So they went public again this past year. So a great uh, success story for the company. So I, start, I wanted to start with this sort of, uh, this chart that uh, is actually from a book called The Messy Middle by Scott Belsky. Scott's actually a good friend of mine and, and section mate from uh, business school at Harvard Business School. And he is uh, the current chief product officer uh, of Adobe. Uh, and you know, he talks about sort of this journey that you know, everybody goes through, right? And I oftentimes show this, this uh, image to uh, our teams, uh, both at Rackspace and here, around the fact that you know, if you are on any sort of entrepreneurial scale journey, uh, it's never sort of always a, a straight line to, you know, uh, to the top, right? And so you're gonna go through this uh, these ups and downs and the seesaw motion, and you're going to have wins and you're going to have losses. And I'm sure many of you relate to this. Uh, but the important point here is as part of the scale journey, as long as the sort of the slope of this line is on a positive upward trajectory, you're in good shape. Uh, and as CEOs and leaders of SaaS companies, it's important to, you know, always take a step back and to assess the general slope of, you know, whether you're, you know, are you, are you consistently, uh, having wins and are you sort of moving generally in the direction of where you need to move uh, or are you sort of you know moving kind of flat or down so that's you know I think an important sort of skill to be able to sort of internalize so um, I always think back to this chart as sort of as when it puts things into perspective when we go through this journey which is always not straightforward so to focus the discussion today around the scale journey I thought we'd talk about four key pillars uh, and the ones that I believe are the most important ones uh, to sort of keep in mind as leaders uh, scale their businesses uh, to get to that elevated revenue number. Uh, so the first, uh, the first category is product market fit and expansion. So what this is all about is, you know, what are ways in which you can ensure that your product is fundamentally sound, that you're solving a huge problem for customers, all of this, by the way, before you scale on a go-to-market side. And how do you expand the scope of the use cases over time, right? So those sort of questions. Uh, the second category is go-to-market approach and expansion. And there, you know, there are many ways to go to market. Uh, what are the options? How do you decide which one's best for you? And how do you expand your go-to-market over time? The third one is around competitive differentiation. Uh, so with so many companies and startups, how do you really stand out from the pack and grow despite the competition? That's sort of a big question for many of us. And then finally, uh, state-specific team. And you know, can you really, uh, you know, can you really scale to 250 million with the same founding team? Probably not, right? So across product and go-to-market, you're going to need different types of people along the way. And so I think that's an, uh, that's another kind of big category. So a lot has been written, by the way, about categories one and two. So I will, you know, go through them a little bit faster, and I'll spend more time on three and four, which connects back to also the community point I was mentioning. So let's kick off. The so first one is product market fit and expansion. Uh, and you know, the, the key points here uh, you know, are things like when you think about two categories, fit, uh, which is the first part of that definition, and you think about uh, expansion, the second part of that definition, there are a few things to talk about. One is when you think about repeatable value with regards to fit, 
you know, you definitely want to make sure that you're delivering this, you know, very consistently to your customers in an at scale sort of way. Uh, and it's sort of, it's very much sort of a machine that is being reproduced in terms of value creation and value capture uh, for that customer. So, you know, if your onboarding experience is not set up very well, you know, that's going to be a problem because if customers don't see the value to the product very early on, and then you're sort of, you know, moving on to trying and doing uh, other kind of new types of customers or even the temptation of taking on things like custom enterprise customers before you have the sort of the foundation down, that can be very, very difficult. And, you know, I've learned this the hard way, you know, growing, you know, past like decade of doing this, it's been very interesting to, 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 to learn it as you sort of do it, because if you don't actually have the repeatable value, it can be a problem. Uh, leading indicators, the second point around making sure that, you know, you're looking at not just the, uh, the outputs or the uh, lagging indicators for giving you a sense of, you know, whether or not you're on the right track. Uh, but also looking at, you know, things like, in our case, for Stack Overflow for Teams, we spend a lot of time right now focused on how customers are adopting the product, how are they interacting on intercom, how are they, you know, are we, uh, how are people responding to in-product nudges, all those sort of things, and, and adoption of certain features we launched, uh, and so on. So those leading indicators give you a good sense if customers are seeing value and are likely to renew and all those sort of things, right? Uh, problem journeys around uh, making sure that, you know, if you think about, expansion, uh, how do you expand the utility of your product? You can think of, you know, you're maybe focused on a very specific part of the value chain today. Uh, you know, in Rackspace, for example, when we would think about cloud services, we folks, we started actually with managed services, which is how do you run on AWS, right? But when you look earlier in that cycle, you can think about things like, how do you architect for the cloud? How do you think about uh, topics like DevOps culture and so on? And so you're, you're really in cost optimization is a different, you know, further down the line after how you run the cloud. So those pre and post items, that gives you a sense of how you can expand the scope of your product. And then finally, use cases, you know, you may be focused on a very specific sort of use case. In our case, for Stack Overflow as an example, we primarily serve uh, engineers and developers and we start there, you know, that's the primary use case in making sure they break down barriers between themselves. But then you can expand to DevOps and SRE and architecture and product and product marketing and customer success and even go to market teams. And you know, you'll have likely have to make changes to your product as you do that, as in add in more features and so on. But that's another way in which you can expand the scope of your product uh, in terms of use cases. So that's the product market fit and expansion, a few key points there. Uh, let's talk about go to market uh, approach and expansion, the second point. So on this one, similarly, if you think about approach, uh, there are a couple of points. One is product-led or sales-led or marketing-led growth. These are sort of important points. Uh, you have to decide ultimately, uh, you know, uh, if you think about the first one item there, you need to be clear and align on one of those uh, with your team as the motion. Uh, and that basically means that you're gonna invest in how the company responds to customer needs, are you going to focus on the user, which is typically a product-led approach, or are you going to focus more on the customer top-down uh, at a CIO, CTO level? Is it a hybrid approach? I think it's very important to sort of take a, have a point of view on this because it really aligns, uh, you know, your leadership team and also aligns how you invest in your, in your company and how you allocate resources. So that's very important. And there are pros and cons for each product-led, sales-led, marketing, product-led, very much Stack Overflow is now a product-led company. Previously, it was an engineering-led company, actually. Um, Rackspace was more of a sales-led company. And, you know, you have plenty of marketing-led companies, like an Apple, as an example, right? So you've got their pros and cons for that. Uh, freemium and free trials. So it's hard to be in, you know, B2B SaaS without the ability for users and customers to try before they buy. Uh, and developers and technologies especially do a lot of this and hold the power increasingly to make recommendations. Uh, and this is very true, especially when you're relying on a bottoms, -led, bottoms up uh, product led motion that I described. And I'm happy to report, I'll mention this in a bit, is that yesterday we launched Stack Overflow for Teams, this freemium offering, ironically, after we launched the enterprise and mid-market products. And I'll explain why that is in a second. But uh, you go check it out if you're interested. And then um, the direct versus indirect sales motion, can you do it all on your own with your direct sales team? Or do you need to use third parties like uh, you know alliances or channel partners or system integrators? Uh, that's an important trade-off, which is your primary sales motion. You might want to pick. Generally, you want to pick one because I think it's very difficult to do all of them at the same time uh, until you have a level of scale. And then finally, unity unit economics, which uh, should be an explicit priority 
if you want to create long-term fundamental uh, value with things like LTV, the CAC and the payback period for those things. All right, and then expansion, uh, you've got verticals. That's one way to do it, where you can actually say, you know what, beyond, um, you know, if you want to pick uh, a industry verticals, for example, Stack Overflow for Teams, we spend a lot of time in financial services. So all the big banks, et cetera, work with us. Uh, and, and once we get to a certain critical mass, we would be able to have things like solutions and packages and bundles of other products relevant to that particular industry niche. And you would measure things like attach rates, et cetera, that's relevant to that. So that's, a, that's one way to go to the market through verticals. Uh, another way uh, to do this is through segments. So you could start either in, uh, typically the, you know, the story people start in the SMB, they move on to the bid market segment, they move to the enterprise, that's how we did it at Rackspace. Uh, ironically, a stack overflow for our team's product. We started in the enterprise, then moved down market to mid market, and then moved down to SMB and we just launched freemium. So literally the opposite direction. Uh, and that's unusual. Our stack overflow path is unusual. Most products start from the bottom and move up. Um, we just have a platform that works at scale for again, hundred million users. So we had an enterprise grade platform that we could work off. And so we had a distinct advantage as part of that. And then geographic, geographic areas, that's another way to think about expansion is how do you think about, you know, where you start, how much you can replicate in a different country. Uh, so if you start in the US, are the use cases and the customer characteristics and needs and pain points similar in a place like, let's say, EMEA in the UK. Uh, it was the case for us uh, at Stack, uh, even at Rackspace. So many things are applicable, you know, across geography, but, um, you know, you might have to think about things like local language support, current local currency billing, uh, local go-to-market teams, customer success teams. So it takes a, definitely a thought uh, and effort to make sure you do this successfully. So those are the ways in, you know, typical ways in which folks expand. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a good framework for us to think about all the ways in which you can grow from a, uh, from a uh, go-to-market uh, perspective. All right, and then the third point, so I'll spend a little bit more time on this competitive differentiation is around, um, you know, which is sort of, I think, ultimately sort of the heart of strategy, right? And if you think about, uh, you know, the ways in which you can do this, there are probably three categories. The first one is product. And you hear a lot of, you know, everybody here is aware of the ways in which you can differentiate on a product basis. So it's features, it's quality, it's reliability, it's price, distribution, and so on. Uh, you know, you're very much, uh, you know, you, a good example of this would be like, hey, Hondas and Toyotas are known to be notoriously reliable cars. You, know, you can run them for 100,000 miles with no issues, uh, as in, but they've created a brand because of that product reliability aspect, right? The second vector or pillar rather that people think about this is brand. Um, and, you know, there are many parts to creating great brands, you know, the values that your company stands for, the heritage and the story, the, the packaging or the, you know, the convenience or customer support or quality and so on. Um, and there are so many great examples of companies that have created great brands around this. One example would be, um, you know, Zappos for uh, customer support, you know, the shoe company that Amazon owns. And they're notorious for, you know, there's this, all these stories about how, um, you know, they would stay on a call with the customer for hours until they actually got the, you know, the exact order shipped and, you know, they would wait on, they would order pizzas uh, for the customer from the local pizza delivery store. They would just go to the extreme lengths. Even at Rackspace, we had a very similar mentality around what we call fanatical support. And that was all about doing whatever it took to make sure the customer was very, very happy and going to the sort of the, the ends of the earth to make it happen. So that's one example of how brands get created. Uh, and, but there are many dimensions through which you can do that, as you can see here. And that's a very, again, a very popular way to, to start things. And a lesser known, but you know, what we believe to be a very, very important way to, uh, to differentiate is through community. And you know, this is obviously sort of our, uh, our expertise and I'll mention, you know, there are five sort of key tenants of building a great community. Uh, example, when we think about Stack Overflow, the things that really come to mind when we've done this is creating a really a shared identity. Uh, in our case, for developers and technologists who absolutely love helping their fellow developers and technologists, uh, you know, is sort of a huge draw. And that's how the whole, you know, the foundation of the community and public platform was created based on that shared identity. The second one is around incentives and rewards. And this is all about the gamification on our platform and the upvotes and the downvotes. 
uh, and badges and recognition for you know the best uh, top rep users and so on. And this gives a tremendous sense of accomplishment of helping your fellow development technologists. We even have a influence score, as in like your one question and answer that you you know maybe you answered a question or you asked a question. And that impacted millions of people. And we actually showcase that impact in, in your profile. Uh, and that's just, that's just amazing because, you know, it is, uh, we were also very fortunate that we had amazing founders that, uh, that created this platform that has lasted for over a decade in our case. So that's the second pillar. The third one is around building with the community and not for the community. So you can't be an entity from the outside trying to do something. You have to do it in collaboration with them. Uh, and we've done this over the past 12 years, again, with very strong partnership over the years with our power users, uh, which are called our meta users. Um, and, you know, we, we effectively partner with them to really create ultimately what is the governance framework. It's all the rules. It's the how the platform is set up, the moderation, how does it happen? And, and you know, even introduction of new sites. We have over 150 websites, 150 sites. Uh, you know, on top of the front, you know, uh, stack, stackoverflow.com, we have a whole bunch of stack exchange sites. And that's why we're able to get to the scale that we're at, which is, you know, over 200,000 signups and over 50 million questions and answers. And all of that was possible because we built with the community. Uh, the next item is breaking down silos. So really having associated communities, whether that's in our case, all the, uh, you know, technology centric communities like, you know, full stack engineering, cloud, DevOps, AI, ML, data science, we've been able to sort of really have, and this is a little bit of a work in progress for us where we're trying to actually create a more holistic tech, um, uh, tech sites, stack over and all the technology sites on stack exchange. How do you make sure that you break down silos? There's more and more technologies that the lines are blurring, right? Uh, it's a, a DevOps, uh, especially uh, somebody who's focused on the DevOps movement in a company is very much, you know, learning lines between infrastructure on AWS or how they write code, you know, full stack engineering is another example of that. So it's important to do that. And then virtual cycles, the last point, which is really to have this ability to have uh, the public platform and other products be able to really have that circular motion where you create that network effect that uh, that rises all boats. So that's the, you know, the fifth item that I think is very, very compelling. And one other point I'd mentioned here is that the order in which you do this is important. So most companies, uh, you know, start with a great product, they build a great brand, and then they go build a great community, right? In our case, you know, we have actually started with a great community to Stack Overflow. We built that as a result of that, have a great brand. And now after about, you know, over a decade of doing it, we're on our product led SaaS journey, right? So this this order matters. Uh, I think most people, like I've said, go left to right. We're going right to left, uh, and uh, you know there's some good examples of companies that have done it, even right to left. And obviously, we're on our path. MongoDB is a good example, one that started as an open source community and now has sort of created a very successful product like Motion, uh, and so on. So that's you know the framework in terms of competitive differentiation, which I hopefully is useful. And if you think about uh, the value of community, because that's again our focus, you know, in 2019, there was this uh, survey done uh, by uh, First Round Capital that talked about that 80% of founders reported that building a community was as uh, important to their business, was very important to their business. Uh, and 28% uh, said that it was critical uh, to their business and how are they say, um, it's, it's very, very relevant, especially, you know, when the world is becoming a lot more distributed, a lot more remote friendly, et cetera. Uh, I suspect mostly the community will become even more prevalent as a source of competitive differentiation beyond product and brand, as I explained on the previous one. So that's all about community building. Uh, and now, you know, let's talk about a couple of examples, right? So even those outside of the tech space. So if you think about Peloton, uh, you know, they have something like 3 million subscribers, they have, you know, 800,000 bikes, their home fitness community has exploded in a huge way, obviously, this past year, and they've, you know, really uh, broken up sort of this isolated activity into a group and community activity, which is a great example. Upwork uh, has a massive community of freelancers and permalancers, and, you know, they use their site and app to ensure they feel really supported. Uh, those folks in that network. And then of course, Stack Overflow, we have over 100 million uh, users and 3 million 2020 uh, questions, but overall we have about 50 million questions and answers uh, over the last 12 uh, years. Uh, and so it's just, you know, these are good examples of how you can actually really put community at the center and, and really be able to, 
to drive uh, great traction for growth. And so uh, in, in our case, we are obviously obsessed with community. We're blessed to work with all the developers and technologists to create communities on our public platform and also internal communities through our Stack Overflow for Team SaaS product. Uh, and they're just the, the, why does this matter? Because the developer's DNA of sharing uh, aligns for our mission statement. And that is, by the way, helping write the script of the future by serving developers and technologists. And so we really, really uh, value uh, what we do and we find it extremely fulfilling uh, to do the work that we do. Uh, overall, you know, I think when you think competitive differentiation, the, um, uh, you know, when you think about folks like Warren Buffett, he talks a lot about uh, competitive moats or strategy moats. Uh, and a moat being, you know, if you imagine a medieval castle and the body of water around it, and we're trying to depict that here on this image, uh, think of community as that strategy moat, right? Because we have, again, 100 million folks that are congregating to kind of do what they're doing and sharing information to go and innovate a lot faster with all this shared information. And that's a huge uh, competitive uh, differentiation. It promotes stickiness. Uh, many to many interactions between the community creates virtuous cycles with organic scale. And uh, you know this that cannot be replicated, right? Uh, that is true competitive differentiation advantage, and that's sort of the core of, of strategy, um, and that's you know ultimately the goal here. So, and so with that, you know we have in our case at least we have that competitive moat, and then we've got we have over 100 million people uh, on a monthly basis that visit uh, our websites. And uh, there's a tremendous sort of ecosystem and that surrounds our paid SaaS products like Stack Overflow for Teams uh, and it serves the same users ultimately. And uh, to make this like really real, we actually even just yesterday, so all of you can go uh, check, it, check this out on stackoverflow.com slash teams. Yesterday we launched freemium uh, to that community where they can leverage our Teams product for free until for 50 users. Uh, and it has it's a tremendous, it's basically the leading asynchronous collaboration platform and knowledge sharing platform for, for, for entities. So companies can use them, open source communities can use them. Uh, if you and a small group of people, develop, fellow developers are working on something, you can use it for that. So, it's, uh, so that's another example of how we are expanding into this, 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 uh, this journey that I just described. Okay, and then the last item around state specific team. Uh, if I talk through that is, you know, there are, you know, let's just categorize companies in three different phases, right? So there's early, mid and later stage, and that's very, very broad. So let me just put some round numbers. It doesn't have to be too super strict, uh, but if you define early as between zero to 25 million, right? Uh, as sort of a very broad definition. And you think about both the product lens and I'll go to the go-to-market lens in a second. On the product side, you're probably going to start with a fairly small, tight-knit group, founder-led, uh, very blurry lines, no fancy titles typically, uh, a lot of direct customer feedback. If they need to get to really to the heart of the customer problem, uh, and so that your pro your product solves that customer problem, and you have a lot of deep customer empathy, so a lot of people are in the in the detail of doing that. Uh, and we did this at Rackspace when we launched our cloud services business. You know, engineering folks were right there with customers. We're not necessarily formalized product folks. Everybody was just very close to the customer to help go build that product, right? Uh, on the go-to-market side, typically when you when you're starting, you know, you you also want somebody that's very very close to the product and the customer problem. So not typically your your sales leader is not your typical sales leader. He's mo mostly sort of an evangelist, and it's uh, and that evangelist is leading uh, the ability to talk about the product is you know have, likely to have a very scrappy sales and customer success team, probably combined, uh, probably like you know, what I describe as a ragtag group and not typically from these typical functional backgrounds. There are people that are very good at what they do, but they have sort of the very kind of cross, uh, uh, they're generalists more than they are specialists at this stage of the, of the equation, but very, very valuable to start out this way. And then in the mid stage, let's call that you know, 25 to 75 million. Uh, on the product side, you start creating probably a fuller product team with specialization like product management and user research and product design and so on. Uh, on the go-to-market side, you're beginning to you know, put in place a true builder uh, VP of sales who's got a lot of discipline and cadence and methodology with things like MedPick and Bant and so on. We use MedPick at, at Stack Overflow uh, and uh, at, at Rackspace, we used to use Bant. 
um, and uh, you know you have this specialized sales organization, uh, which is uh, which is important. So you have outbound sales and inbound sales, and and uh, and so on and so forth. And then finally, you have um, uh, you know this ability to actually create uh, pipeline development through uh, true marketing demand gen. Uh, you know, capabilities through tools like Marketo and other things, or maybe an outbound sales development through, uh, you know, people calling out into accounts uh, and generating demand and pipeline that way. And then you also have typically at this stage, a separate customer success organization focused on renewals and upgrades and so on. So that's the mid stage. The late stage to wrap this up is to talk about, you know, let's say companies that are between 75 and about 250 million in revenue. And uh, the product uh, focus there uh, are a lot of the mid-stage items like, you know, voice the customer, uh, you know, cabs, which are customer advisory boards, roadmap reviews, offering management, where you're really sort of exploring business cases and, you know, commitment pitches and so on. We did this a lot at Rackspace uh, in our business. And then um, very much a deliberate focus on, you know, market differentiation versus market relevance. What does that mean? market differentiation is how are you relative to your competition? How are you differentiating relative to them? Market relevance, meaning are you at least up to, up to snuff with regards to the competition? Are you doing almost as much as what the other folks are doing at a minimum, right? And then of course there's technology debt, which is a different topic. But uh, when you have a lot of competition and you have incumbents starting to notice your presence, uh, resource allocation becomes really, really important at this stage. And uh, from a go-to-market perspective, at this point, you are moving on to more of a true forecasting machine and predictability uh, type VP of sales. And so you're, you know, you're running sort of with a lot of sort of foresight into, you know, in, into the following quarter and uh, a lot of, you know, at scale things like sales enablement and sales strategy. And that starts happening even in the previous stages, but to say that this is taken to a new level I think is an understatement, right? So territory planning and deal desk and all these other things that you need uh, to have in place uh, at this stage of the game. So that in a nutshell is, uh, you know, the, the state specific team piece. So to summarize four key elements, one is product market fit and expansion. Second is go to market fit, go to market approach and uh, expansion. Third one is competitive differentiation and uh, the fourth one is state specific team. And again, competitive differentiation is through product, brand, and community. Community being obviously sort of the understated one, which I believe will become more and more important as we continue in this mode that we are in. Uh, so with that, uh, hopefully this frame was useful to all of you. Uh, and as you sort of proceed in your own SaaS scaling journey, and if you want to learn more about how companies build communities, either internally or externally, please reach out to me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I hope these were useful ideas for you to adopt in your own uh, SaaS business. That was, that was well done. I, I learned a ton. Uh, I'm sure everyone else learned a ton. People are super engaged. A few questions coming up here. And, and fundamentally, I like that uh, model, right? It's like build a community, then, then sort of create, they offer lots and lots of value. And then, you know, sometime they'll, you'll be able to monetize that. But it's like a sort of give first help you become successful by enabling the success of others philosophy. And, uh, you know, I'm a big, big fan of that. There's a few questions here. When you follow the route of community first as your competitive variation, how do you fund or get investors when the money or buy-in isn't the first step for your VCs, right? You know, firstly, you need to know that it's not, you're not the only one that is, uh, that is going to encounter that issue because of the example that I shared, right? So Stacks is a good example. You know, our first check in our Series A was in you know 2010, so two years after we kickstarted. So take a little little bit of time for it to create this organic community and so on. MongoDB is another good example, similar sort of. They they have a common investor in us in Union Square Ventures. There are venture capital firms that actually care about building great communities. Period, and so they care about that first before they actually think about you know, revenue and all the other things that are going to be organic at some point. So I think, you know, you'd be surprised how much power there is and, you know, kind of interest there is in starting that community first model. And, and we're seeing a lot of community models getting funded like this year, right? Like I think uh, even I saw a tweet by Jason Lemkin where he said, predict 10 leading communities get VC funding in 2021, maybe more, right? Yeah. It's it, portions of the business model may be tough to scale, 
but communities are the new brands. And I completely, completely agree with that. I mean, we're a small company relative to a lot of other companies, but at Boast, focus big on community. We built traction. It's got almost 100,000 subscribers today. And everything from the VCs who funded us when we were raising money to all our major partnerships, customers have come as a result of, of building this traction community. And uh, yeah. uh, generally people, um, if you don't, you have to be really passionate about giving first because there are times, especially in the early days when you're bootstrapped, you can't eat because you're building this community. Right? Yeah. Uh, you got to starve to build it. But if you're really, really passionate about relationships and building community, I think, uh, I think it all follows. This is great. There's another question here on product led side from Anatoly. He's building a great company called Pact, mm. uh, P-A-Q-T. What if you had to build a product led startup from scratch today for business owners, sales managers across North America, what would your top three actions be to grow and acquire the community? Like if you had to start from scratch. Interesting. Yeah. I would, so, so one, one question like product led, which is, uh, you know, this is like foundational to say, let's actually create something of value that somebody uses. Don't, you know, don't think about revenue. Don't think about that for the moment. I think that ultimately what you want to do there is establish a common problem, create in the community. Like I mentioned, one having that shared identity is super important, right? So there are enough people that are all sharing this kind of problem in our case. Uh, back then there was this company called experts exchange that had you know a paywall behind content that was relevant for all of them to use but the nature of you know a, a, like i said a developer is to share and have the dna is to actually share information in sort of a democratized and democratized way and that shared pain with the paywall with the need to actually say let's actually share it more broadly was the reason that the you know the community sort of kicked off right so i would look for what is the shared identity uh, with you know the space that you, that you're that this person is looking to kind of build out, and if it's sales managers or you know whoever else, what is the shared problem? Can you actually gravitate to solve that problem in a way that is community first, and then over time, if you become the de facto for solving that as a part of that community, then you can create you know products on top of that that are product led that add more and more value, and you can charge for and so on and so forth. But starting with a basic problem that everybody has, but you can band people together to do it is the first step. Definitely. Here, Marco from Social Nature asks, when your model includes both customers, which are, of course, paying you, and users, community, which are, you know, just uh, just getting, you're giving value to them for free, yeah. how do you decide which side of the model to focus on first? How do you allocate resources? Because this is, this is very hard, right? Like, you got to mm -hmm. eat versus, you know, I'm giving. Yeah, yeah, it's an excellent question, actually. And I think that, uh... So to my approach uh, and our approach at Stack is very much a, a hybrid, what I describe as a hybrid go-to-market, right? So what we are doing at the moment is we have a, a user base that we're trying to engage bottoms up. And that's, you know, everybody in the world uses Stack Overflow. Any company in the world has Stack Overflow users. And that's from bottoms up. And more and more, those folks are influencing decisions that are ultimately made at the senior level of the organization to say, what software did we buy, right? For what reason? So it's, uh, so bottoms up, that's that motion. That's the product led motion, right? In product, organic adoption. Tops down, then when you come in, you can say, you go into a company, you can say, you know, you've got, you know, let's say 3000 people in the company out of which a thousand people are using the product bottoms up anyways, right? And then you're talking to the top down from a customer lens, you're making the case for things like security, you're making the case for why you should think about this more strategically enterprise wide. And so that's the hybrid go to market. It's not, not dissimilar to how Slack did it, not dissimilar to other, you know, kind of product led SaaS companies have done it. Uh, even MongoDB is similar to that. So that's how I would think about it. But there's a time and place, you can't do both typically at the same time, but you have to start with one and uh, go with the next. Ironically for Stack Overflow, it was sort of a little bit of a zigzag. They started with the user journey with the public platform, went straight to the customer, went top down, but then there wasn't a true product motion and that's not what we're doing at the moment. So we're trying to kind of connect the dots on both. But there's different phases where you focus on different elements of those. You've been a follower of Stack Overflow, now a CEO there. Um, looking back, what would you do different, if anything? Yeah, I mean, this is a, it's an interesting question. I, I would say, you know the the maybe what I was what I found interesting is sort of the the complexity of 
uh, dealing with, there's a lot of stakeholders in this company relative to any other company, right? So one of the things of adding community is most, SaaS, most product companies, you're, you, know, you have customers and then you have you know, users and you have uh, you know, uh, yourself and you're serving them and you're building products that serve a problem or address a problem. Coming into a role like I did as, as a new CEO with an existing community of you know, 100 million people that are using the public platform and then having products that were on the other end of, of, the, of the, the building that were trying to sort of you know, create a business model, the, I think it took a lot to appreciate. You know, it actually makes a lot of sense to bring all of this stuff together because you know? actually it's only one user Right. And like, I think we didn't come to that realization fast enough, but I think we, we had gone fast. We say, well, you know what, there's actually the same user. It's all about the developer. And then let's just start there and work backwards. Okay. Then it's like, okay, the community public platform is the first phase. Then you have this product with multiple tiers above it. And so it's almost like, you know, bringing that jigsaw puzzle together to have a coordinated unified product strategy, I think is, uh, was a very sort of, uh, a, a big, um, realization along the way. And that, you know, managing that is quite complex because you're working with pretty big scale. So you can't really sort of like make a lot of big changes in the public community without, you know, going through a certain process where everybody is on board. So there's a lot of things you have to kind of like keep in mind versus an early stage startup that can sort of pivot on a, on a dime and do X, Y, Z, test a few different things and keep going. Here you're dealing with an existing massive community, right? So that's the realization. And then the other thing is when people think of communities, first they start, to think, they start thinking of tools. Oh, you know what? Maybe I should use Facebook groups. Maybe I should be, build like my own community tool. Maybe I should put them on Slack. And the reality of the situation is if people are congregating in any mode offline um, or, or online, but like they're coming together, uh, you can give them a platform later, but it's like facilitating those interactions uh, in, in a quick way. Like, you know, Ryan Hoover with Product Hunt, it was just an email newsletter uh, mm -hmm. that turned into Product Hunt, right? So the question here I'm trying to ask is your community, they're developers, but Twilio has a developer community. Uh, Stripe has a developer community. Um, do, you see oper do you see yourself needing to differentiate or collaborate? And that is a key one because that could make or break companies. Yeah, I, I would say for us, the way we think about it is that we serve a very specific uh, slice of the community, right? So meaning we focus on developers and technologists. So that's our specialty, right? And with that as the foundation, uh, we the world's developers and technologists show up on our community. It doesn't matter which company. So like as an example, Amazon Web Services, we have 200, over 200,000 questions and answers in our public community. Yeah. Microsoft Azure, same thing, 200,000. Uh, and you know, Snowflake, they moved their entire technical Q&A to Stack Overflow in late 2019, right? Wow. Same thing with Mapbox, same thing with uh, Sensha. So like all these companies have decided that why would you go and try to create a community from scratch when you already have a community that's highly engaged and operational and has the network effects and people are going there anyway. So organically, if people just encounter Snowflake, encounter AWS, it would be silly to go and try to create that from scratch. It's kind of like, almost like, you know, if you're trying to host a party, you, let's say that the party happened somewhere and yeah. it was happening every night it was always full, right? Are you going to try and host your own party and create a bigger buzz, spend a lot of marketing dollars to go do that? May, may not make sense for you to do it because you, know, you may, or, may or may not succeed. But if you already know that all the people go to that party, then you might as well show up and say you're MongoDB, right? So that's the, that's the benefit. That's, that's awesome. That is, that is awesome. So the way I see it is like, you guys are the stack overflow is the Marvel for developer communities. You're like, like sure. the Marvel universe <laughs> kind of thing. Prashant, looking back at your career, as you look back, what do you wish you did more of, you know, going back to like the 17 year old coming on a scholarship, Cornell, Harvard, like, you know, the best of the best, right. And, and what great success you've achieved. What would you do more of? And what would you do less of? From my perspective, I think I took a very interesting sort of path around, um, you know, being sort of very broad. I'm sort of, I've always sort of believed having sort of a well-rounded uh, skill set's important. Like, you know, my parents always uh, were big fans of cricket. You might have been a fan growing up. Yeah. And so being an all-rounder was important as in like you're well-rounded. So for me, my approach has been that. And I think, you know, that was, uh, that sort of guided me along the way. Although I would say looking back, I wish I'd taken a little few of uh, more risks, I think along the way, right? Because I think you don't really, um, I think I sort of like took a very sort of logical 
brick by brick type of approach. And I think being more entrepreneurial much earlier in my career, I think would have been even more fun uh, relative to sort of like, you know, you learn along the way, I think in my, in my mind. So that is, uh, that's sort of the, that's the thought process for me. Definitely. Now I'm, I'm thinking about what you said, the Marvel or the super community of communities. If yeah. somebody wanted to start their own community on Stack Overflow, like what would be the process? Like how do we use Stack Overflow as a channel for community and growth? Yeah, great question. Uh, stay tuned on this. We have some developments happening uh, in Q2 of this quarter. Uh, sorry, this year. Uh, so literally in a couple of months, we'll be making a, an announcement about this. So, the, but, the, but like uh, there's other people who've done that. Basically, they start a, uh, the, the, like a, basically a community on like, like you outlined, right? What, what are they doing specifically? Some of them like start a Q&A on, you said, on, on Stack Overflow kind of thing. Though, yeah, so those are already happening. So big companies are moving like Snowflake make the announcement to say all their technical Q&A now exists on Stack Overflow. They have moderators like Google and Amazon have full-time just people at their, their companies spending time answering questions on Stack Overflow, right? So that's implicitly, we have got that. So that's, that happens. But to make it even more, you know, uh, higher affinity for developers and technology to engage with these community, communities, technology communities on Stack Overflow, that's what I'm saying that we have some upcoming announcements. But you know, CEOs read a lot. Um, and what are some books you recommend? And, and you may read a lot. You may, I, I don't like reading. So I, I buy books a lot. Like this one is a great Jeff Lawson's yeah. Ask yeah. Your Developer that, yeah. I'm, that I'm reading. And yeah. uh, what I do actually to, to sort of my hack for reading is I invite smart people like yourself and sure. interview them for an hour. And then I personally edit the video. So I rewatch it. But yeah. what, what, what do you recommend in terms of like books you've read, blogs you've read? Like uh, what are some resources for you go to? Yeah, I think I, I um, two books that I've sort of I found more recently that I've read, I'm reading one right now, but the one that's actually on the corner of that uh, desk there uh, is one is uh, Mindset by Carol Dweck, uh, which is an exceptional book. Uh, in fact, let me go pull it up. Uh, this this book uh, has been sort of uh, one of my sort of favorites because it really sort of has this really, um, you know, everybody's on a personal journey, like a leadership journey, growth journey, and really how do you stay open to a lot of feedback? How do you, how do you grow to realize your full potential? How do you make sure that you, you know, uh, be able to sort of be open to becoming the best version of yourself? So I think it's more of a more of a personal kind of like a um, kind of a growth type of book, which I think is super, super uh, powerful. Uh, big, big fan of this book. The other one that I recently read actually, uh, which I might also have here uh, is uh, a book called uh, Tape Sucks. And this is uh, by Frank Slutkin, the CEO of uh, Snowflake. And this book is interesting because it's relevant to me on what I'm doing, which is coming in from the outside as a, as a new CEO into a company. And he's done that very successfully over the past few years. So he walks through sort of his journey of how he did it at this company called Data Domain, which was sold to EMC back in the day. And it's a very sort of, it's a, not a very thick book. So it, I read it in like half, you know, a few hours on a Saturday. And uh, it was very insightful uh, in and general. What does tape sucks mean? Is he referring to like red tape or just tape around like when you come okay. in? Yeah, tape, tape as in like uh, magnetic tape, you know, on drive. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. All the stuff. Yeah. Awesome. This uh, Tape Sucks by Frank Slootman, Mindset by Carol S. Dweck. Prashant, thank you so much again. Great pleasure. Thanks for having me, Lloyd. And uh, thanks for everybody for your wonderful questions. I need some traction.